Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Pete Peterson, and I'm Dean of Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy. And I'm welcoming you here to Pepperdine's DC building for the next panel in our California to Capitol Hill conversation series. The theme of this series is to examine public policy issues that have a particular impact or resonance in California as well as nationally. Last year, we looked at housing finance reform, which remains a very important set of policy issues for Californians trying to afford a home. And today, we'll explore the condition of public sector pensions and retirement more broadly. Various estimates agree that California leads the nation with nearly $500 billion in unfunded public sector pension liabilities. With the major state pensions, CalPERS and CalSTRS, our teachers' retirement system, combined with at least $136 billion in unfunded liabilities. This is an issue that redounds down to the county and municipal levels, both in California and nationally. Los Angeles County, the county in which Pepperdine is based, alone carries a $7 billion unfunded pension liability cost, and the city of San Francisco, $2.3 billion. The numbers can get dizzying and almost unreal. Try the national figures where researchers at RAND have totaled the state and local government unfunded pension liabilities to range between four and six trillion dollars. On a percentage basis, the median funding level for our public sector pensions nationally is only in the low 60% range. All this during one of the great bull runs in the history of our investment markets. The condition of our public sector pension challenges should also be seen in the larger context of national retirement policy and behavior. A 2016 Employee Benefit Research Institute survey showed that 42% of American workers have saved less than $10,000 for retirement, and 64% have saved less than $25,000. This reality has some states, like California, considering a state-run retirement plan. As a policy matter, pensions and retirement present a mix of complexity, organized interests, predictions of market performance, wrapped in an issue that we all just kind of hope is going to solve itself. <laughs> Thankfully, we've assembled a group of experts who study this issue through a variety of lenses and have proposed a number of very thoughtful solutions and who, judging by our panel call, are all good-natured about what can be a very depressing topic. You have their bios in the brochure there at your tables, but in order, I'm excited to have here Kathleen Kennedy Townsend from Georgetown Center for Retirement Initiatives, Josh Gottbaum from Brookings, Chris Berman, former Connecticut State Treasurer and President of the Institute for Pension Fund Integrity, Mike Belsky from the University of Chicago and their Center for Public Finance and former municipal mayor, and Wayne Weingarten from the Pacific Research Institute. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. So we agreed on our panel call that we wanted to make this uh, much more conversational. We are not going to begin with opening statements. Uh, and so I wanted to begin with just some uh, targeted questions first and then open it up for conversation. I hope that you all, I know in looking at the guest list, the experts are not only on this side of the table, but we certainly have some uh, out in the audience as well. So I'm hoping as we uh, go through the conversation that you uh, have questions. I'll certainly be opening up the floor for those uh, shortly. And in the design of these questions, I'm going to be telescoping. So I want to begin first with a discussion uh, beginning looking at our, uh, the state of our retirement system more broadly, and then begin to focus on pensions and some of the challenges there. First start with scoping out the, uh, the scale of the challenges before us, but then moving to solutions. Kathleen, you've looked at the state of our retirement system uh, of public and private sector workers. Um, could you tell us a little bit, I mentioned before in the intro remarks, about how little we are saving as, uh, as Americans broadly, but could you tell us a little bit about the challenges for non-pensioned workers in America? Yes, well, I think you've done a very, first of all, I wanna thank everybody for coming today, and I wanna thank this great panel. 
and, um, and for you for putting this on. And one of the things that is important, I think, to understand is that um, in, the, in our lunch or in our meeting before, Josh had said, um, why don't we talk about pensions alike? This group does talk about it, but why doesn't the general public talk about pensions? And in large part, um, they don't talk about it because they're scared, they're fearful, and they feel guilty. Um, and if you look at psycho psychologists and psychiatrists about what people don't do, is that when they feel guilty, and, and people have said, you're, you're bad because you haven't saved, they don't want to talk about anything, and they go into a fetal position. And when you look at the statistics about how few people, how few, how little money people have saved, they feel guilty. They've been told it's your fault that you haven't saved. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to do is change the paradigm to say it isn't your fault and there are solutions. And they're pretty simple solutions. It's not complicated. And there's really a way that we can do things that is different. It's simple and it's easy and we can get things done. And with that kind of different message, I think we can solve problems. And I'll tell you what the message is that I have. Because if you just focus on problems, people are going to go back into the fetal position. It's like with the groundhog. He sees the cloud, he goes back <coughs> into the ground. And what we want to say is there's sun outside, and there's, there's going to be something good that can come of it. So I've been working with a group, Tony James and Teresa Golucci and the Economic Policy Institute and Randy Garden, Randy Weingarten and Josh Gottbaum and others that says, let's do what lots of countries around the world have suggested that we do, we take. For those who don't have a retirement system um, or a, 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 in their, offered by their company, we'll take 1.5% from your employer, 1.5% from your own salary, put it into um, a fund that's to, that's uh, that is use that is um, allocated like a pension fund. So it's you know a completely diversified fund. It doesn't have daily liquidity, which is kind of a waste of of money. You know why do you need daily liquidity when you're going to be putting in the fund for forty years? You then uh, when you retire, you're going to get a monthly paycheck for the rest of your life which is what people want. They don't want to need a lump sum. They need a p monthly paycheck for the rest of life so they feel secure. And th that kind of fund has worked around the world. Hmm. We've tested that idea, um, Pete, and 76% of Republicans and 76% of Democrats, and listen to this, 86% of millennials like this idea. Now, why do they like it? Because it makes sense it's easy to understand, and too often, people who do things that in, the, in this space are complicated, because that shows you're smart. If you just don't want to be smart, but want to be simple, you can win. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, we are going to... Does this require the federal government to somehow miraculously come to a decision on something? <laughs> I don't talk about miracles. I talk about <laughs> <laughs> this is the, the tr you know what? When 76% of Republicans and 76% of Democrats and 86% of millennials like an idea, I have mm -hmm. great um, uh, faith in the ability of good political organizers to get things done. Well, Josh, I, I want to bring you, <laughs> Josh, you're somebody who's worked on the federal government side, but also looking at private sector issues. You had headed up the U.S. Pension Benefits Guarantee Corp. under President Obama. Um, but before we get further into possible solutions, tell, tell us a little bit in the audience about uh, how defined benefit pen, uh, pensions have changed in the private sector over the last few decades. Okay, the... Um my view of retirement is similar to Kathleen's in the sense of it's a really complicated thing. Mm -hmm. Partly because it's complicated. Partly because the way the government has handled it has kind of put it in a box. Mm -hmm. It has not changed with the times. Because when you look at what's happened over the last century, what's happened? The answer is people are living a lot longer. Mm -hmm. And that means that if you're going to want if you're going to want to retire at what used to be thought of as the normal retirement age, you're going to need to save a lot more. But do we do that? No, we haven't. 
Right. Um, if you're gonna live a lot longer, maybe then you should think about working longer too. Mm -hmm. But, and our social security system has a modest adjustment in that area, but only modest. Right. And so the, the basics of a traditional pension are pretty simple. Actuaries make two kinds of guesses. They guess how long people will live, and they guess how much money you set it aside will be will be earned over the next thirty or forty years. Right. Uh, I would describe the pension crisis as, importantly, the result of the fact actuaries <coughs> guessed wrong. Wrong. In the nineties, actuaries guessed low. In other words, they thought that pension assets would earn seven percent. Better. And in the 90s, because the stock markets did really well and the bond markets did really well, the pension plans everywhere, public plans too, public mm -hmm. plans, private plans, all kinds of plans, were overfunded. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, yes, but there might come a time when, they're not, when <laughs> the stock market is not going to do so well, unfortunately, the actuarial profession said, gee, maybe we should raise our assumptions. And so, they said, let's assume that the stock market is going to, instead of averaging six or seven, let's assume it averages eight or nine. Right. Okay. And then, as you all know, for the last 15 years, the stock market has not exactly done what the actuary hoped and what the investors you know. And as a result, all pension plans were underfunded. The, the, so one set of issues is uh, who pays for the mistakes of the past? Right. And that's an important part of the challenge we'll discuss when we talk about public pension. Yep. The other piece of it, though, that I think is worth noting is that because we, in an exercise of what we thought was paternalistic good judgment, set very high standards for retirement plans, half the businesses in America don't choose not to offer them. And so part of what some of us are trying to do in California, in Maryland, Kathleen came up with an idea, and I got stuck with implementing it, <laughs> um, is saying, how about a form of retirement that is not as heavily regulated by the federal government? Mm -hmm. That's the IRA. We're, mm -hmm. trying to, we're, trying to do, we're trying to do that. Mm -hmm. But vis-a-vis -vis the pension issue, yep. I would say that it was the unfortunate result of the fact that the people who had to guess how much was set aside right. were not conservative. Yep. One, I'll make one last point and then get back, right. which is if you go north of the border to Canada, for some miraculous reason, the actuaries in Canada were conservative. And as a result, what we think of as this global public pension crisis, the Canadians don't have. Hmm. They have been working on the assumption of 4 and 5% returns for a very long time. And higher contribution rates out of that. Because right. if you think it's only going to be, right. it's only going to turn four or five, that means you've got to set aside more. Yeah. So they've been setting aside more for 30 or 40 years. Yeah, that's a great point. Chris, uh, former state treasurer, uh, you, I want to transition a little bit here to look more on the public sector side. And uh, the issue at a, as a state level challenge. And y you've written quite a bit recently on the politicization of public sector pension investments. As Josh had said, you know, one of the challenge here, challenges here is that it's such a complex issue financially, uh, but it seems that we're also making it more complex politically. Um, and so whether it's, you know, this uh, I investing through uh, ESG, this environmental, social, and governance investing or not, um, these types of funds have grown in popularity over the years, but uh, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing the trend lines for how municipalities and states are investing uh, pension funds. Thank you, Pete, and, and also thank you all for, for coming here today to, to listen to us. The, I want to first, Pete, pile on uh, in support of Josh and just say that, yes, the two greatest uh, mistakes that have been made by uh, state and local public pensions has been first uh, incorrect uh, mortality to assumptions uh, of, of mortality. And in fact, we're about to see the greatest expansion of, of uh, longevity in American history 
as we go from 86,000 Americans who, who are over the age of 100 today to an estimated at least 1 million Americans over the age of 100 in the year 2050. Mm. A, a startling figure. Second to that is, is that, you know, who are the people who actually have the best chance of getting to 100? Those people who have health care, also uh, pretty much a, a, a well or highly educated group. By the way, I've just defined your, your average state employee, highly educated, motivated, knows about health issues, has access to health care. If you're in Connecticut for 10 years, as a state employee, you get free health care for the rest of your life. So when you combine all these things together, guess what? We're not going to be dead oh, at 74 or 79 uh, or, or 80. All of a sudden, uh, we have to start planning on, on a, a payout that could last an additional 20 years. Mm. Um, the second thing, obviously, is assumed rate of return. That's been one of the great uh, frauds uh, perpetrated on both the beneficiary, of which I am one, uh, or will be, <laughs> and, and as well as the uh, taxpayer of our states and our municipalities. The thing that we have focused on in an institute that we formed earlier this year called uh, the Institute of uh, Pension Fund Integrity was meant to bring transparency to all this. I have always found it very difficult to do research on a state-by-state -state basis. You know, it's not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. You have to try and figure out uh, what their performance has been. Sometimes you actually have to dig to see what their assumed rate of return are, returns are, let alone their actuarial tables. So we're trying to bring together a way to not only compare all those things in a one-stop shop, for the benefit of, of the beneficiaries, they can go and see exactly what's going on in terms of their unfunded liability. But in addition to that, also in terms of the performance, how is the money actually being managed? Right. The, which is a big issue. When I took over as state treasurer, we were the worst performing state pension fund in the country for 10 years. Even though, as I like to say, we have more horses, BMWs, and PhDs per capita in Connecticut than in any other state <laughs> in the nation. The... the um, to get to Pete's question now, well, the other issue that we're highly focused on is that you shouldn't be paying, playing politics with my money. ESG is not actually playing politics. ESG, environmental, social, and governance, can have a positive effect on producing alpha. Producing alpha, of course, we mean that we're outperforming our benchmarks. If our benchmark, benchmark is the S&P 500, I want to beat, beat the benchmark. Otherwise, you should simply index to the S&P 500 and the Morgan Stanley Bond index and stop trying to do all these machinations, hiring hundreds of different managers and figuring out asset allocation. Just index the thing if you can't uh, outperform the index. The trouble is, is that it's very difficult to see how states compare to one another, and so we're trying to build that kind of transparency. ESG can add value on the bottom line, but the reason why you invest in companies that embrace ESG or even E or just S or just G right. is because it's adding to the performance of the stock or, or, or the company or the company profits. What, what we are insisting on is that you are not motivated because you're somehow trying to change society with my money. That's what you can do with your state money. I used to be on the Appropriations Committee in the state of Connecticut. Uh, and we could go in ahead and have economic-focused, uh, you know, zones and tax-free zones and all these different things to help our economy and create jobs. But that's not the right role for my retirement dollars. My retirement dollars should be invested for the, the benefit of the be uh, beneficiaries exclusively, which means that you shouldn't have a personal political agenda. And so we have to, Pete, we have to separate those two things. Right. For example, when state of California... Uh, let alone what, what uh, Comptroller Stringer is trying to do in the state of New York right now, which is to strip out, in the case of New York, fossil fuel stocks, in the case of California, tobacco stocks, something I faced when I was state treasurer. You know, I, 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 as I say, I wasn't elected to play politics with your money. I was elected to get the highest return at the most reasonable level of risk. And I think that's what should drive our decisions, and that's what should, should drive how the money is invested. Thank you, Chris. Mike, you've worked at the city level, uh, and also you've written quite a bit about Illinois, which, which might follow California in some of the public sector pension uh, unfunded liabilities. But you've, you've also written about some of the, we're, we're going to talk a lot about the financial aspects to this problem, but you've also written about some of the social costs yeah. uh, to this. And uh, sometimes 
I, I think one of the reasons, and this goes back to Kathleen's point, one of the reasons uh, that this can get so uh, difficult to wrap our arms around is that the numbers are so big and uh, some of the issues seem so complex, but there are stories there. There are social costs to some of these decisions as well. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, again, uh, thank you for having me and thank you for being here. I just I was curious though that I, at Pepperdine there's a view of the ocean and I'm looking at a fire escape. <laughs> <laughs> Not all campuses are created equally. Um, I, I actually am outraged at my state. Uh, we have we have $130 billion uh, in uh, pension fund liabilities for five funds at the state level. And when you get to Chicago and places like that, uh, city schools, it's, it's just as bad, if not worse. Um, and a lot of our problems were done through legislative design. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, we have a, a ramp up that started in 1996 uh, that runs through 2045, and in 2045 will be 90% funded. That ramp up started with a payment of about $636 million. It was designed to, to grow gradually. It's now uh, $7 billion. That's the pension payment. Uh, it represents um, about 20% of operating revenues for the state, and um, it is 29% of our GDP. So those are big numbers, uh, and what it's really meant is that um, retirees of the system are nervous. They were just made uh, a little less nervous because reforms were proposed, similar to Maryland, Connecticut, and other places, and, and those reforms were protected constitutionally. So we, we have a pension clause that uh, does not allow you to alter uh, benefits in any way. Um, we have a compounding, a 3% compounding uh, COLA that um, was also passed by a governor uh, as, a, a, again, looking at th times were good, we're going to be generous. Uh, they tried to change that, what weren't able to do it. Um, but but the, the outcomes are um, we had... Uh, we have had close to 800,000 people leave the state over the last five to seven years. Um, we've had a million people that were receiving social services from the state, uh, no longer receiving those social services. And in my view, you read about gun violence in Chicago, um, I'm sure that's a contributor. A lot mm -hmm. of people have become very desperate um, because they've lost any sort of support they had. Um, you know, I don't know if you can prove that connection, but I think about that. Um, we also have had major cuts to higher education. Um, some 130,000 minority students have lost their scholarship grants because uh, the state, because of the pressures on making this 7 to $8 billion payment, uh, can't fund higher education. In fact, not only is the state at the lowest rating, uh, and, and has borrowing costs that are probably 2 to 4% at any given time above what they should be paying if they were higher rated. Uh, there's a contagion effect. Um, they, they estimate that local governments uh, in Illinois have spent probably close to a billion dollars more than they would have to to borrow uh, as a result of the state's condition. So bondholders are... are reluctant to, or they want a risk premium for anything that's sold in Illinois. And I, I was mayor of a town that's AAA rated. Uh, it's Highland Park, Illinois. It's 20 some odd miles uh, north of the city. And, uh, and they're paying up. And they shouldn't be, you know, given that, that sort of rating. Um, so there have, there have been real uh, human impacts. State spending has been level over the last 20 years, which means they're not, and uh, certainly not keeping up with inflation, not putting money into education, they're not putting money into infrastructure, because so much of their budget is being consumed uh, by uh, pensions. And, and if you add it to debt, about 30 uh, percent of their budget is going to be, or operating revenues will be dedicated to fixed costs. Mm. So it's a real stress. And so basically what you're describing are the crowding out effects yes. that are happening with these uh, pension plans and, and uh, the fact that it's not something that's just focused on the retirees, but actually it affects everybody 
in a in a community. We're certainly seeing that in California as well. Right. I mean, I think you know one of the uh, in the federalist system um, there there is uh, the federal government can't really up, up interfere with the state or local government's ability um, to do its job. Right. Um, and, you know, these constitutional protections, for example, that Illinois has, I think someone can make the argument that the quality of government uh, as a result of these liabilities is so high that that constitutional protection should be overturned so that adjustments can be made. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll come, come more to the solutions here in a minute. Uh, Wayne, finally, you, you've you written quite a bit on, on California, my home state, and um, uh, but you've also been looking at some of the public sector pension underfunding, um, looking specifically at the relationship between risk and return. And so I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that connection, what it's meant for underfunding. Oh, sure. Uh, it, it actually gets a little bit to what we were just talking about. When you invest, right, in general, if you're earning the, the average in, the, say, the S&P, so you're getting 7 8% over the long term, you get that return because you're bearing risk, right? Your stock portfolio can go up. It could go down. Uh, you know, personally, like, I have uh, two kids that are about to go to college, so the, the money that we save for them, that's actually not in the market anymore just because there's a very big bill. My, my daughter only likes private schools for some reason. I don't know why. Um, Pepperdine? And, Is that what just – No. Well, my son, my son's Pepperdine, though. Okay, he loves LA. All right. So, uh, Let's talk. <laughs> uh, so you know, there, there's that risk. Uh, but on the pension side, and all the things we were talking about here, that's a certainty, right? We have a certain obligation that we have to pay, and you know, it's scale depending upon kind of the demographics of the working population and the retirees. But those are known with certainty, and so we have this kind of imbalance where we're saying, okay. We have these liabilities, and we're going to value these kind of the, the, the long-term cost of liabilities based on what we think we can earn on the assets. But it's not the assets that matter. What matters is the fact that whatever happens, right, whoever gets elected president, wherever the stock market goes, we know in certain years we have this obligation. And that's why we're talking about Canada. Why, why did their actuaries make a better guess? And I'm not familiar with it, but at 4 to 5%, if you think about the average mm. rate on a 10-year treasury, which is usually approximating the, uh, the riskless rate, you're getting closer to that. Treasury is around 3 4%, something in that range. And so that Canada is actually valuing it closer to, much closer to, the, the risklessness that needs to be kind of embedded in these structures. And so if you actually started to properly account for the risk, a lot of the excessive benefits, a lot of these other problems that come from it, you know, that wouldn't happen because you would actually be forcing kind of at the time of the decision, okay, if we want to pay this very generous pension, well, we know we need to put aside a much larger amount because we're discounting at 3%, not at 7%. We talked about complexity, unfortunately. Uh, and so that's going to make a very big difference because you're making those costs known more up front. But more importantly, you're combining together the risk and return. And right now what's happening is, in effect, we're assuming we're going to get kind of a good result from a risky outcome. And if that doesn't happen, well, the taxpayer will pick up the tab, either in higher taxes or fewer services. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's what we're beginning to see in California when you see some of the, you know, Vallejo and the different bankruptcies. You know, services are being cut, libraries are being shut down. Uh, you know, police forces, I believe there's instances yep. where that is, is occurring as well. And so the, if we're going to get the reform correct, we've got to, at the very outset, combine that kind of... Uh, risk and return issue so that you don't have one person getting the return and another person bearing the risk. Yeah, and, and, and the, this social cost element, I, I think, really is some, a good friend of mine is, uh, and we were talking about this back in the, in the green room, that a friend of mine is Chuck Reed, former mayor of San Jose, Democrat, and uh, very much of a city that leans uh, more to the left, uh, definitely a city that has significant uh, public sector uh, union presence, but he was able to get a, a pension reform measure passed through a public ballot initiative, uh, really making the argument that uh, the pension system as it was set up was crowding out services that didn't just impact the retirees, mm -hmm. but affected everyone in 
the city. And I think that's a part of this uh, set of questions that if there's a way through in how reforms are communicated, it's to make people aware that really everybody's on the hook if we're not able to resolve uh, some of these issues. Kathleen, I wanted to, you, you have uh, talked before and, and back to the, the broader issue of retirement uh, security and the possible role for states. You've uh, spoken in the past about uh, West Virginia's move from the 401k system. They gave that uh, a test run and have now moved back to more of a uh, defined benefit plan. Tell a little bit about that yeah. that story and, and what they have tried to do. Right. Well, that was, it's a, so each of you have described um, the challenges of a defined benefit plan and the cost to the state. And so one of the interesting experiments was West Virginia, which tried to reduce its um, liabilities for a defined benefit plan. And they went to a 401k plan. And then they decided it didn't work. And in partially it didn't work um, because the returns on the 401k plan were so low as compared to defined benefit plan that the governor, Joe Manchin at the time, said this is going to be a disaster for, for our employees. And it's just an interesting question um, in the ways that each of you were describing it. And they were really compelling. You know, we're, we're cutting library services, we're cutting higher education services. But in doing that, we weren't discussing what would happen to the employees who were, you know, there are two parts of uh, mm -hmm. that we have to discuss when we're thinking of a public employees. One, how do you recruit them? And two, what happens when they retire? So in recruiting, one of the arguments for recruiting public employees is to say, if you work here for a 40-year period, you're, you may not get as much money, but when you retire, you're going to have a good pension. And so when West Virginia went to a 401k system, the teachers, as you can imagine, you heard them strike just six months ago, said, this is, without a pension, these low, these low um, salaries are too much. We're going to move to Virginia or Washington, D.C. or Baltimore, I hope, um, <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to get a better salary, number one, um, or, the, or you can move, um, number one. And two, he discovered that the low returns were so bad for the retirees that they just couldn't live on them because they didn't know what to invest in and they just were just doing so poorly. Mm -hmm. So he thought it's, it's immoral to ask um, employees to go to a 401k. So they moved back to the, um, the, the fine benefit. Plan. And yet one of the – I've now watched this movie. I so many times in so many places. I too, I too, I'm from Evanston, so um, um, I, I'm from Illinois. Great town. So I'll talk. So I'll talk about New Jersey. Okay, my home. Okay. Where, Pete, where, where, where Pete is from. Um, as I said, part of what went on in these pension systems is that actuaries made guesses. They did not make conservative guesses, which. You know, I would have liked for them to have done. Mm -hmm. It's not that they were bad people, but they did Good people do, do bad things. Who, yes, can, yes, can yes. We, can but I ask, who hires the actuaries? Oh, the plans do. Yeah. The right. So is, is that pension. true in Canada, too? Yes. yes. In other words, I'm trying to figure out if you had a different contracting system. Um, it, it, that's probably more than we want to do in, 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 the, in this audience. I'm just always aware of who I, your I, client I th is. I think it relates to whether or not you regulate pensions and insurance with the same regulators. Because it turns out we regulate insurance very conservatively. We didn't regulate pensions the same way. And as a result, they, okay. they, well, they made mistakes. Well, Hazel maybe want to point okay, that yes, out. Okay, yes, yes. Um, for, the, for Hazel. But the question is then, what happens right. when a plan gets dramatically overfunded? Yeah. And Kathleen pointed out the first reaction in this movie, and it happens every, every time. single time, is okay, let's just get out of the pension system and start a 401k. Mm -hmm. What that does is, in effect, it says it makes future employees right. pay for the mistakes of the past. Right. Now, as Kathleen also pointed out, future you can make 
future employees pay such a high price that they don't want to actually be, they don't want to work for the city of Oakland. Mm -hmm. They'd rather go work for Oracle. Mm -hmm. Baltimore, I was thinking excuse Baltimore. Me, yes, the <laughs> next, but the, so that's step one is that. Step two is to say, let's, pay, let's soak the taxpayers. Right. And not notice, these are not the taxpayers for whom I worked in the 1980s and 90s. These are today's taxpayers. So today's taxpayers are paying, in my view, for the mistakes of the past. The past. Third is that, uh, and it's compounded. It was compounded in Illinois. It's compounded in New Jersey and a few other places. Because the legislatures, the actuary said, put aside this much money, and the legislatures put mm -hmm. it aside this much. They put aside less than the, than the annual uh, required, con required contribution. Mm -hmm. But we can't go back and sue those guys. We can't sue the governor of New Jersey in 1993, whomever that, who that person was. Well, if you sue the governor of Illinois, he's already in prison. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't think we can get enough out of it. For it. Um, so yeah. we ha the Hobson's choice we have is we can then go to soak the taxpayers who are not you know, it wasn't We're their not fault. It, right. it wasn't their action. Or we can go after the retirees, if the Constitution permits it, who it's also not their fault. Yeah. And most jurisdictions that have faced this have decided that, miserable though it is, yeah. it's better to soak the taxpayers than to soak, ret than to soak retirees. Right. And uh, the, the, in my view, the case of this, the, the textbook cases was Detroit, because Detroit, unlike most states, Detroit actually could declare bankruptcy and did. Right. And they went through a process of, in that bankruptcy, they could have eliminated the pensions entirely, they could have reformed them, et cetera. And what they did is they cut the pensions by, if I recall correctly, about 8%. Mm -hmm. They could have cut, eliminated them entirely. Why didn't they? Partly it's because they wanted somebody to keep working for the city of Detroit after it came out of bankruptcy. Right. And partly it was because they thought it was fairer to soak the bondholders, that the bondholders could handle getting soaked more than retirees could. And that's, yep. to my mind, that's the really hard part about this problem. Yeah. Um, it's that the people who I'd really like to, to send a bill to, right. I can't hard send now. a bill to. Chris, you were you were state treasurer, and you had you went through the process of, of reforming and reducing the unfunded liabilities in the state. So I did. I also chaired the bankruptcy board of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Okay, yeah. so you know, <laughs> and and I I I I'm not going to say I got into trouble, but I got I got uh, I incurred the wrath of the mayor before he went to jail for seven years. And, they, and then ran for governor and then, again. And then, and then got, came out and got reelected. But anyway, <laughs> the, because I said you can't fix Bridgeport. You want to break it up like a company that that has uh, uh, gone foul and 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 take pieces of it of it and spread it out to the surrounding communities. The Detroit at least has a incredible history and and uh, at least some semblance of a talent pool so that it can be it can still it, it still has a life. And I think that they probably did the responsible thing. The reality is, is that when we are talking about how much unfunded liability we're facing, again, going back to your opening statement as well as mine, and that is just for example in Connecticut, Connecticut I think um, states that their unfunded liability is somewhere around $35 billion. In fact, even Ned Lamont, uh, running for mm -hmm. governor right now, who was the original chair of the investment committee, uh, advisory committee when I got elected state treasurer, even Ned Lamont has said it's probably closer to $100 billion. And if, in fact, the state of Connecticut has $100 billion unfunded liability, and on top of that, the uh, other benefits uh, after retirement, OPAB benefits, which, uh, as one of our senior advisors, Jim Daly, has spoken about extensively, um, that if that adds another... Ten billion, then how do you how do you actually uh, fix a problem like Connecticut's when it's 110 billion, uh, and and how do you then plan for it both in terms of its assumptions and its actuarial uh, assumptions and whatnot? So this 
there's a potential here, and, and that's what we focus on, trying to shine light mm -hmm. on this problem. Mm -hmm. There's a potential here that this, this crisis is far greater than anybody is talking about. Now, I will tell you that it's almost never written about in the state of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. It's beginning to get written about, but it's almost never written about. It's fantastic that we have uh, uh, representatives of the media here today because the more light we can shine on this and the more truth and honesty and transparency we can shine on this, the better, a the better able we'll be able to make uh, sincere, tough, but also um, um, a good policy uh, decisions to fix this problem going forward. One thing yep. that, that I think matters is, and I'm not going to get into the questions about accounting for how big the underfunding is. Let's just say it's a lot of money no matter how you slice it. <laughs> I think that the best way to deal with it in most cases is to recognize it's a big debt that it is unfair to, after people have worked for you for a lifetime and retired, to cut the pension. So I think in the end of the day, unfortunately, it comes back to the taxpayers. But that doesn't mean that it can't be paid off over a long period of time. And from my perspective, that's what we're going to end up doing. We may say otherwise. Politicians may not want to say that the debt is $100 billion. They may want to say that it's $30 billion. Mm -hmm. And personally, I care less what they say than that $5 billion a year goes into the fund so that over the next 20 years, it's well, and I, I, I just wanted to interject I, here just, just one second, one second. Okay, sure. um, because what we're seeing in California, this is about how these things get communicated to taxpayers. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the real challenges that we're beginning to see in California, and I think the fact that we also led the league in bankrupt cities during the Great Recession, it, it, mm -hmm. I think maybe raises the issue uh, higher up uh, on the awareness of most Californians is I think with each tax raising measure that's proposed, there are an increasing number of voices saying, that's not really going into schools and cops and firefighters. It's and, and actually paying the for these other things. And I just wanted to, uh, I'm gonna come, <laughs> I just wanted to go, Mike, because Mike, you'd mentioned, uh, written a piece recently in Cranes uh, in the Chicago edition about the city's efforts to actually sell pension bonds, uh, and maybe there's a different way, uh, with an example from Australia, actually, yeah. uh, for a along with the process of probably revenue raising that's going to happen, but uh, another possible way that, uh, that cities, if not states, can consider uh, raising the funds necessary. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I can tell you in Illinois, there is a, it's not a matter of a uh, ability to pay. It's a willingness to pay. Mm. I mean, we, we uh, kind of short of talking about assets, um, we're, we're one of three states that doesn't tax retirement benefits. If we tax retirement benefits on people making over 50000 a year, that would bring in close to $3 billion. You know, if you're looking at this $8 billion that ramps up, it still ramps up, uh, you know, the $16 billion by 2045, but you kind of chip away at it. Um, we also, uh, we, we tax 17 of some 400 services that are uh, um, taxed by other states. Mm -hmm. um, another close to a billion dollars. So there's no uh, uh, political will there uh, to act. Um, you know, I, I take a very uh, hard approach that, yeah, it might have been services provided in the past. Uh, you know, it's unfair for future generations to pay for a service we received in the past, but it's a debt, and, and paying uh, off your bonds is mandatory. Uh, legislatures need to start looking at pension payments as a debt, not a soft liability as a debt, and, mm -hmm. and make a commitment to make the payment. It might have to crowd other things out, which is unfortunate. And that's where the uh, transparency comes in. Right, Everybody right. needs to, yeah. But I but, don't but think on the other, oh, well, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. No, no, on, uh, on the other side, what you were referring to is, and what I wrote about is um, there was a book that came out, I think that uh, 
you published, uh, Brookings published. On, uh, it's called the, uh, it's called the uh, um, Public Wealth of Cities. And it's a different approach where they say, um, you know, rather than looking at the liabilities, which is a pension bond, you know, is basically increasing your liability. You take the proceeds of the bond. You have to borrow at a taxable rate because you're benefiting the pensioners. It's not a public purpose, so to speak, in the bond law world. And you put that in the fund. Uh, that brings down the liability and therefore, from an accounting standpoint, reduces the payment that has to be made. And you're making a bet that you're borrowing at 5% uh, and your expected rate of return on that $10 billion is going to be somewhere around 7 or 8%. So you, you cover that debt service with those earnings. If you're wrong, uh, you know, it, it falls on the taxpayer. Um, another approach is to take public assets that you own. So what I talked about in Chicago is, you know, taking Midway Airport or um, the lottery, et cetera, and putting that into your pension fund. So similar to the bond, you take these proceeds, right? You, you value the asset. That's a difficult thing to do, admittedly, because there's not a public market for these. But there's been a lot of activity in privatizations and public par private partnerships where they do value these assets. And you put them in the pension fund. Many of these assets are on the books at cost. So if you go to a market value, you're going to get a bump right there. That reduces the... Uh, accounting actual required contribution because you've lowered the liabilities. And the theory is is that pension funds is, ha have this fiduciary responsibility uh, to manage their assets to the, you know, in the, to the highest and best uh, performance that they can. Uh, they don't always do that, but uh, th they might do a better job maintaining, expanding, improving these assets mm -hmm. because they have an incentive to do so. And, and then you would take any of those efficiencies or savings from the cash flows and you can put those towards the pension payments. So if you have excess cash coming off a water system that's in the pension fund, that can go towards uh, making the pension payments. There's a lot of complications because most of these entities have outstanding debt. They have obligations to bondholders. Uh, there's a question of whether... If you, put the pen, if you put the asset in the pension fund, does that then make all their debt taxable? That's being worked out at the federal level now. And so uh, the example was Queensland, Australia's uh, pension. They put the uh, Queensland Motorway into the pension. I think its value was $3 billion. They sold it several years later, I think four years later, for $7 billion. New Jersey just valued their lottery at $13 billion, and that was put into their pension fund, and they saw a bump in the reduction, you know, a reduction in the unfunded liability. So, mm -hmm. um, so taking the assets that... Yeah, and I, th I think this problem it is, you know, I sometimes wonder in Illinois and other places, you know, where's the sense of urgency? Uh, you have to think creatively yeah. uh, as well, and I, and I think there's some hope with that approach if it can be done. Kathleen. Well, I was wondering um, the role of, you said you have to pay off the bonds. And it seems to me that the bondholders were also, you know, I'm thinking of who has been irresponsible. Obviously, the legislators were irresponsible. Mm -hmm. But the bondholder, the, the people who issued, the, the people who bought the bonds were mm -hmm. also irresponsible because they knew that, the, that things weren't going right. Mm -hmm. So my sense is if, if people stopped paying the bonds, as I said, would that waken them up and say, you have to pay attention to what this is worth? I mean, that, that's, that's what bankruptcy is about. You know, when you go into bankruptcy, it, uh, right, but bonds are on the table, you know, all general senior debt on yeah. the table and, and, and pensions. And typically bondholders do get hurt for that very reason. I mean, I, I don't think it's, I You're think it's partly any, political. Yeah, no, no, I, mean, no, I, I, I think it's partly, mostly political. Right? Part, partly political because... Uh, if I'm the mayor and I'm going to screw over uh, my constituents who happen to be also state uh, city employees and city retirees. That's a public policy term, yeah. screw over. Just right, okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> versus, versus the bondholders. I mean, I'm going to pick the bondholders every time. I know. Well, um, you, 
But I think the thing I would say in defense of the bondholders is that what is it? the yeah, disclosure, is the, yeah. the disclosure, uh, sometimes. I mean, we uh, the, the municipal bond market has changed. Uh, I I think uh, two thirds of the holders of bonds are high net worth individuals or mom and pop through mutual funds. Used to be big institutions owned bonds, insurance companies, corporations. Um, Mom and pop are not that sophisticated when it comes to disclosure and what to look for uh, in, in the book. I mean, if you look at a fund financial state, a, a, a co comprehensive annual financial report, I mean, in Highland Park, we have captains of industry that own big companies there that you, you handed them that, their head would spin. They'd never be able to figure it out. So, mm. you know, there, there, there are some problems in, in, in that respect. I mean, your idea of you know, making this transparent and understandable to the public will go a long way to improve investors' intelligence about municipal bonds. I want to get to Wayne in a second, but after Wayne, I just hope uh, we have about uh, 20 minutes to go, and I want to make sure that you have time for questions as well. So I'll, Wayne, I'll be real quick. I, I just yeah. we were talking about you know, who's going to bear the cost, and we're talking about the taxpayer is an easier uh, target, if I can use that term, to bear the cost. And I think there's an interesting interconnection that gets lost because – if you target the taxpayer, one, you're going to impact economic growth, and that's going to be bad for the overall environment. But on top of that, we started the conversation talking about the broader pension, that the average person has what, I think you said, $10,000, 33% have only $10,000. And by targeting the taxpayer, you're now making it more difficult for those individuals to secure their retirement. So I don't think it's as easy as to say, oh, well, you know, we don't want to touch the pensions because that was promised. And so if we do that, you know, we'll, we'll hurt their retirement. So let's just get this kind of vacuous right. taxpayer. But those are actually real people as well who mm -hmm. are trying to save for retirement. They're and not so there's but that's not true. That, that actually, I'm going to argue with you. I love it. Okay. <laughs> the people don't automatically save for retirement. They, okay. they don't. They don't. That's one of the problems. The, do you know what the median income for um, how much people save for retirement is? No, oh, it's incredibly. I think it's twenty-five thousand. Zero. Zero. Okay, median fine. Half of Americans have nothing saved for retirement. Half. So it's not that if you give them money, they're going to save. Mm. They don't save. They only save if they they have an employer-based savings program that gives them an automatic way to save. But this so isn't talking about that. This is talking yes, about. Yes, you were going to. You were to say, if you give money back to them, they'll save. They won't save. No, what they'll I was saying is if you, if you take the money away from the taxpayer, you're making it that much more difficult for them. No, no, no. Whether, it's, whether it's through the company, if you, if you make the environment that much harder for a company to make, to make profits, they won't be able to afford the 1.5% no, 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 to, to fund no, no. the retirement. No, 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 that's not true. That's what I'm arguing. This is an important – I just want to lay out for everybody, this is an important argument because this argues, and I want to make this very clear – that people don't save because they have money. They don't save because they don't have an automatic paycheck, um, uh, paycheck that gives, you know, right. that they can check off. It has nothing to do with whether there's money in their money. Of course it does. But well, if that, no, that's, that's, actually, I mean, I think if, all, if you have the uh, people you know, who are actually just doesn't. There are people with a lot of money, and they don't save. There are people with little money, and they save. And it has to do with the system that they work for. That's what makes them save. Yeah, okay. I mean, I think this is right. I want to, I want to get to that. We've got some question. very patient audience members. We can go to questions, uh, but that's an important, important argument. Yeah, okay. I, we'll have to agree to disagree on that. I, I okay. think both things can be true. Pete, I need to I know, jump actually, in. Uh, actually, uh, uh, also, as a wrap-up, I'll be very quick, one minute. <laughs> the the, the uh, Michael did say fiduciary responsibility. And, and that it's for the highest return and at a reasonable amount of risk for the beneficiary. That is so important. It goes to what I opened with, is that why are we allowing people to make individual political decisions? You know, I've never smoked a cigarette in my life, but should, should it be tobacco? Should it be booze? Should it be gambling? Should it be marijuana stocks? Should it be energy stocks? Should it be gun company stocks? Where do we stop people playing politics with my money? Mm -hmm. So keeping politics out of the money and that my decision is part yeah. of fiduciary responsibility as we deal with this gigantic hole in the ground right. that we policymakers have created. I think the gigantic hole in the ground is large enough so that I'm not going to argue with you about whether you <laughs> <laughs> divest from tobacco. Stores. Okay, <laughs> questions <laughs> from the audience. Questions from yes, in the back, sir. We have a microphone passed around. 
We haven't mentioned the big elephant in the room. The Republicans. No. <laughs> uh, but uh, Ms. Townsend alluded to it. People don't save for their pensions because people don't have the money to save for their pensions. The median income in this country has been flat since the Arab oil embargo. How in the world can you save for a pension if you don't have a pay increase? I don't think that was the point you were <laughs> no, making. No, actually, actually, sir, I'm sorry, that wasn't my point. Let me just give you an example. Um, in, in Oregon this year, they passed a law that says um, every small business, uh, every business that doesn't offer a, a retirement should auto have an automatic um, enrollment. enrollment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these are people who obviously did not take their money and put in their money into a retirement. When they were offered an automatic enrollment, 80% of the people did it. So when they were offered an easy way to save, 80% of the Oregonians took them up, took up that offer. So why didn't they do it a year ago? Because it wasn't easy a year ago. When it became easy, they did it. Now, 20% didn't do it, but 80% did do it. And that's my point. If you make it easy and simple, people respond. If it's difficult, they don't respond. Mm -hmm. Question. Now, I mean, one other point? Yep. And uh, that was 5%. Yes. The um, average was 5%. Uh, it wasn't even 1.5%. It was 5%. And Josh is now trying to decide. Can I tell you them what you're trying to decide? <laughs> Whether in Maryland we're going to have a default of 5% or 6%. So we're not going down to my little piddly 1.5%, which I may decide to change that. We may have to go up to 5 or 6%. Um, what I would listen, there are plenty of us who would like to do things to raise average wages, at least so that they track the increase in totally labor, agree. labor productivity. However, um, if I suggested to this panel, Rachel Gretzler, who's sitting in row three, mm -hmm. would come up here and strangle me. Um, the reason why Kathleen and I talk about the idea of automatic savings with an opt-out is because it seems to us the least invasive, least heavy-handed way to get people to save, i.e., if they do nothing, they save, and if it turns out they need the money, they take it out or they, or, or, or they opt out. What we found is that just doing that leads people who never thought they could afford to save to leave the money in, and that's really what um, we think that the government has for – the best of motives has made it, um, has convinced a lot of employers they don't want to have automatic savings at work. And but so we think automatic savings at work is the way to, to get savings. But it seems but, like, mm -hmm. just on the conversation, <coughs> that the plan that's being proposed, CalSavers is in California, Cal is, 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 is a right, yes, similar yeah. system, that it's almost the inverse problem that we've had in the public sector. Right? Is, we have yes. had an automatic right. saving system, but the actuaries have not made the correct estimates. There's been politicization of the investment decisions that are being made. And here we are in a place with four to six trillion dollars in unfunded liabilities. Three how, ten. How, how do you protect a system like this from some of the same problems that we're... That, that I, to mine, is a really important thing, but I want to separate out two parts of your yep. issue. Good. Thank you. One is, what do you do in the future? Okay, Because part of the first reaction, unfortunately, when they see, oh my God, this pension is dramatically underfunded, is to say, let's get out of pensions, let's go to a system like the one in West Virginia that doesn't right. work very well instead. So, right. so let's separate out the question of what do you do going forward. My advice as to what we do going forward is, we have a properly run, conservatively estimated traditional retirement system. Like yep. Canada. We, you, you, like, 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 like the, my wife is Canadian, so th I, I'm not paid to do this, but. Um, <laughs> so what, but You're this, encouraged, though. Yes, yes. The second piece of it, though, is the mistakes of the past. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it does involve these really miserable set of choices. I'm in favor of 
any form of financial creativity so that politicians who are afraid of fessing up nonetheless get to something that is fiscal that is financially more 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 responsible mm -hmm. but unfortunately what's happened Pete, is that we have in effect thrown out the baby with the bathwater and 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 that to my mind is means that we'll have a future retirement and, problem and, 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 and throwing out the baby with the bathwater includes the notion that we're just going to sock it to the taxpayer when we have to pay for this. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a figure. State of Connecticut collects six and a half billion dollars a year in the income tax. Less than 700 people pay half that. Mm -hmm. Connecticut is second in the nation only to Illinois for people who are move, moving out of the state. Guess what happens when you, when you want to raise those taxes? People leave. Mm -hmm. What would happen if you raise taxes on on people whose retirement dollars are, are, have not been taxed in Illinois, and now all of a sudden they are going to be taxed? Mm -hmm. They're going to make an informed economic decision, and that informed economic decision is: I'm not taxed in North Carolina. I'm not taxed in Florida, Texas. Florida's pretty nice this time of year. Why don't I just move to Florida? Which is why Florida is the number one state that Connecticut taxpayers are moving to. Yeah, that's true. And, and, and so, you know, it's a fool's, it's a fool's errand because you are going to destroy the, 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 not only the philanthropic, but the talent base of your state mm -hmm. if you think that we're just going to soak the taxpayers again and again and again. I, 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 the only argument I would make to counter that is that um, we, we're, we're in the headlines, every downgrade that happened. Um, we're in the headlines because higher education institutions are getting downgraded, uh, getting cut. It, if those things were all fixed um, and there was growth associated with it, um, I think people would be less willing to leave even if there was some additional taxation. Uh, I think the, the, the fact that our costs of borrowing is so high, I think that is le leading to the out-migration now, is that we're just a disaster. And it's it, and the tragedy is you go to the city of Chicago, you know the bird should be the crane, right? I mean the, it's just booming. <laughs> New companies are coming there, uh, it's growing. Um, it's rated one notch before junk. Uh, its pensions are unfunded, uh, and it's just it's perplexing, right? And and I think people in government need to step up and acknowledge that. We made these commitments. We have to pay them off. Let's set the fiscal ship right, and I think that'll solve a lot of the problems. You, you might lose people. I mean, there's elasticity in taxation, yeah. but people have other reasons to stay there. So, Wayne, quick thought before we go to the next. No, we can go. They, he, they hit my thoughts. Okay. Next question. Yes. Oh, here. Yeah. I've spent the last 39 years working for the teachers' unions in Pennsylvania and Maryland. In both states, I've seen... Uh, cuts to pension benefits, and I've seen increases to employee contributions for those lower benefits. Um, and in both states, it, it was due not only to um, the um, overestimate of earnings, but to the underfunding of the employer's share by the uh, governors and state legislatures uh, in, in both states. That's what got them into deeper trouble than anything. They didn't listen to the actuaries and said, we're going to fund less. And although people perceive that these pensions, the defined benefit pensions, put the, put the investment risk all on the employer, in fact, the employees often feel the burden mm -hmm. when, when the corrections are made. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a, a question for you. And, and by the way, I'm a... I'm a um, a director on a private sector pension fund that is overfunded right now. <laughs> we've, con we've consistently put in more than the actuaries have recommended. We have been lowering our return rates on an annual basis, um, and uh, we've been de-risking the fund by, by shifting uh, to bonds from, from equities uh, as, as we're able to. So we're in a point where the discount rates as they increase are lowering our liabilities more than they're lowering our assets. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say my, que my question, <laughs> my, my question has to do with that disc discount rate assumption and the uh, expected trend in, in those rates 
uh, in, in over the next five, 10 years in this country, uh, given the economy. How much will that move correct some of the funding uh, levels that we're seeing in these plans? I mean, I, I would say at our center, and I'm, I'm happy to share these reports with you, uh, we, we took a look at, and I think we looked at Pennsylvania teachers, we, we looked at, um, I think, 20 largest state funds, and, and the finding was that the, the biggest contributor, and, and a lot of these funds were 120% funded and went down to the 60s, uh, was, the, was the fact that the expected rate of return was not met. Uh, so it's a big factor. It um, won't do, let me jump in, it won't do if, anything. If, if the expected rate was more realistic, the, the contribution would have to match. The state would have been higher. Right. And if the legislatures and governors aren't going to listen to that contribution, right. that doesn't solve the problem. It, it won't solve right. the problem, but right. it, it will shine light that, in fact, we have been understating and underestimating the unfunded liabilities because of the game that is played. When we assume have an assumed rate of return of eight and a quarter, and the fund over the last 10 years has un, earned six and three quarters, that gap means we have a much greater unfunded liability than, than is actually being portrayed. Right. The, right. Uh, you know, and, the, and, the, and the rating agencies are now, you know, I don't know if you're aware, but they're, they're using their own discount rate. You know, they're using more conservative discount rates what, to measure what's, liability. What's happening is most folks privately admit that with the retirement of the baby boom generation and other things, they don't expect real returns to capital to be as high in the next 20 years as they were in the, 19, in the 1980s and the 1960s, et cetera. So my view is you are much better off for having a conservative discount rate. It's great that as interest rates rise, your plan will look better. For those plans that are seriously underfunded, the interest rate rise that most of us think will happen is not by itself going to be sufficient to wipe away years of not yeah. making the right mm -hmm. contribution and mm -hmm. years, of, years of being off. The, the math is not all that complicated, but, it's, but the basic fact is, yes, it helps, but the problem that Pete has talked about and Ken has talked about is going to be a problem and we can't wish it away just by thinking that rates are going to rise. And now we have time for uh, two more questions. We got Jim, yes, in the back. Good. So I have um, one comment and then uh, one question. So in terms of the um, case of the defined benefit, uh, excuse me, defined contribution plan uh, with West Virginia, I think, um, I think that points out that the, in that case it didn't work. But that's not an to me, that's not an argument against defined contribution plans any more than it is if we identified a defined benefit plan that was a failure and said defined benefit plans don't work. So I think the, the, the lesson there is to be uh, for uh, plan sponsors to be thoughtful and selective about the audience for the particular defined contribution plan. So I just wanted to make that comment, but I have a question for the two uh, uh, former elected officials. So, Chris and Mike, Mike, you mentioned. Um, and Kathleen. The, and Kathleen. Uh, well, excuse me, <laughs> Kathleen as well. Um, uh, Mike, you mentioned the uh, transfer in kind of income producing properties. And um, I think that is a solution that I'm only aware of being applied when um, government entities are in distress. And I'm not aware of cases where um, it's been used uh, prior to distress situation. And yet, there are so many institutions now that are on the cusp of distress, and I wonder if uh, you could describe uh, your thoughts on uh, uh, using those, using uh, transfer in kind uh, to avoid getting into distress and what the obstacles might be to, to do that. Well, I, I think, you know, there are different degrees of distress. I mean, New Jersey, obviously, with their uh, lottery, is a, you know, is a, a distressed government. I don't know what the condition of Queensland, Australia was at the time that they made their asset and kind transfer. But I, I would say if it's a, if it's a, a best practice and it's effective, 
then any government should be looking at it as a way to, you know, what, what this, the, the book argues um, that I mentioned is that, is that um, government has all these assets out there. It's, they're a lot wealthier than they believe. Um, they have a lot of land on their books that is at cost, that could be monetized, uh, could be improved and then sold off and those assets, you know, and then you're applying your, your assets to where the biggest liabilities are, and those are pensions. You know, you're not going to use that stuff to pay out. You could use it to pay down debt. If you had a well-funded pension, you could take those assets to maybe pay down your general obligation debt. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a worthwhile consideration for any form of government. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're, Highland Park is funded at police and fire, uh, and, and in Illinois, police and fire is ridiculous. We have... You know, so many levels of government, uh, they should be combined into one system, but they all have their separate uh, accounts. And they're funded at, you know, 60%. And it's not a distressed city. They can afford to bump it up. Uh, but if I were mayor, I'd be thinking about the water plant that mm -hmm. spins off a lot of excess cash, has run well. Um, it might, some of these funds might come to the conclusion that I should have someone from the private sector run my asset of that fiduciary responsibility. I want to get to one more question. Yes. Thank you. I just wanted to push back a little bit about this notion that switching to defined contribution plans would be the bad thing. I think the DVs and DCs should be on equal footing if we're talking about a solidly funded DV plan that's using conservative assumptions. That should be a similar thing. You have the same number of dollars going into a DB versus a DC. In the long run, they're probably going to come out with about the same outlook. And I think if we look at what the economic literature suggests, actually DCs perform a little better. The investments in those plans do slightly better than the public pensions overall because we do have issues of playing politics with pensions. And so I think it's unfair to compare in the case of West Virginia or elsewhere to say, they did horrible on returns. It might have been a certain bad market period, but also you can't compare what they were getting in returns to what a DB is promising if it can't actually make good on those promises and it's only 40% funded. Um, and then second, I just wanted to ask for those who do agree with or think that we should be pushing these liabilities onto taxpayers, would you also agree then that for any individual or any private company that is participating in a defined contribution plan, an IRA, whatever, 401k, if they don't meet a 7 or 8% return, should we guarantee the amount, the gap between what they actually have and what that 7 or 8% return is? Because that's essentially what we're doing here if we're saying that taxpayers have to pay yeah. for that difference between what public pensions, mm -hmm. and it's also a private sector pension issue as well. We haven't talked about that much, but you know, union-run pensions have over $600 billion in unfunded liabilities as well. So what we do for one, suggests that we might do that for the other. Yeah, Josh. Ra Ra um, Rachel, you raise so many issues that I know I can't respond to all of them, <laughs> but, let me, but let me try a couple of broad framing ones. One, the difference between defined benefit and defined contribution. Because the defined contribution model grew up from a retail sales perspective, in other words, all 10 employees of company X have to make choices about investments, et cetera. The admin costs of defined contributions have historically been higher. Now, technology is shrinking that. Okay, but that's one. Two is because, as Kathleen mentioned it, defined contribution plans have an immediate liquidity requirement. They have not, uh, for example, Investments in private equity, which until recently did a little better because they were illiquid, didn't go into defined contribution plans. So long story short, there has historically been a slightly better return net-net within defined benefit than defined contribution. However, that's not the reason why folks like me are nervous about the, the move to defined contribution. The reason I'm nervous about it is that it turns out that when people retire with a defined contribution plan, instead of buying an annuity so that they don't run out of money when they're 87, okay, they tend to take it a lump sum, put it in an IRA, and gradually work it, work it, work it down. And so I wouldn't argue that there is 
that you can't make. And in fact, I have a bunch of friends, some at Brookings, some who yeah. used to be at Heritage, who are, PhDs. Heritage, who Thank are, work, you very who are much. working really hard to actually find ways to make the defined contribution model work with you know with lifetime income and all that stuff. I'm for that. I got it. The issue that we have on the public sector side is they've already invested, I don't know, a couple of trillion dollars in, in, um, in, their pension, in, in their pensions, and they don't really have the option of switching. What they have to do is they've got to figure out how they're going to make, make their system work. And I don't think my, the only reason for my comment about switching from DB to DC is that it tended to be it would go from a generous DB to a not very generous mm. DC. But if, if, I, if I could say that part of that is the financial kind of necessities of where you're at, right? So that if your DB is, there's a implicit but unknown taxpayer bailout, taxpayer right. safety yep. net that's there, so that, in effect, the costs of that DB plan are being hidden. And so the DC, if it is that much more or less generous, it's because there was an implicit taxpayer bailout that's, n that's no longer there, and so you're making those costs explicit. And that gets back to the thing about transparency. Right. We can divide when we should def design DC plans that that work, that make sense, that can have take into account, the, uh, as Julie was saying, the educational kind of limitations. I don't mean that in a, in a bad way. That people don't understand, so you, you get them the right instruments. But to say that the, the DB plan, because it has an implicit uh, kind of backing to it, is better than the DC, you're really not making a, 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 a exactly. Friends, please join me in thanking our panelists. Uh, one of the phrases that we use at Pepperdine in the School of Public Policy is that we're about putting the public into public policy. Uh, these schools, if you're not familiar with them, tend to be very expert-driven and prepare people to then go out and tell the public how stupid they are. Uh, as a school that was founded by people like James Q. Wilson and Jack Kemp, uh, there's always been a, a way of looking at public policy at Pepperdine that is focused on what is the public's role. And uh, I think today's conversation is certainly exemplary of that. Uh, what should the public know about these decisions? Transparency is certainly a part of that. And being forthright about really the, the costs and the benefits. And so I want to thank each of our panelists for uh, helping us to understand that. These are obviously very um, acutely important issues uh, for the state of California and obviously nationally. And so I want to thank each of you for uh, joining us here in our slightly less beautiful campus uh, for discussing what is a, a very important policy issue. I hope you stay tuned. Um, you leave with us some of your contact information so we can put you on our mailing list for our next California to Capitol Hill conversation uh, event. But again, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.